uh, environment. Uh, when I was growing up, I grew up uh, in a very in a, in a community where there's a, a very clean air to breathe, and it, it was so sweet. Believe me, anytime I recall, I get very excited because I grew up living with my grandmother, and if you just carry a basket or a basket and go to the water side and put that basket in the river put uh, a bit of sprinkle a bit of gary inside the basket you don't need to throw a net you will see a lot of fishes coming in so we were so blessed our natural environment was so blessed and anytime she's paddling you know with a, me with a canoe to take me to a nearby fishing settlement uh, you see the sound of the bears in the air but all of these are no more uh, mangrove forests have changed from green to gray. Most of the leaves are dead as a result of the fact that those involved and engaged in the illegal refining process do not know how to, you know, dispose uh, the waste products. Uh, I will not entirely put it uh, on them. Uh, also, there are natural oil spillages that occur as a result of old pipelines, you know, that have been, uh, or gas pipelines, oil pipelines and gas pipelines uh, in uh, uh, host communities. So all of this uh, together is contributing to um, the uh, black, uh, the soothing problem we have in uh, Port Harcourt and its surrounding environment. Okay, talking about the oil uh, bunkering and the illegal <laughs> oil trade, Recently, news got to us that the government um, offered to pay or allegedly is going to pay um, a certain gentleman who is an ex-militant, uh, a gentleman known as Tom Polo, four billion naira monthly, uh, so as to be able to protect the uh, creeks from oil thieves. In your opinion, since River State is right smack dab in the middle of the entire oil uh, segment of the country, what is your take on that? And uh, let, me, let me hear first, and then I'll ask my next question. Okay. Uh, first, I, I must let you know that I am also the vice chairman of the Joint Council. I must commend the uh, action... Uh, I'm vice chairman of the Joint Council, Abuja and Northern Nigeria. So I must commend the action of the federal government because uh, they have realized that it's important to use host communities to secure the oil facilities because they are closer to these facilities and they know who is responsible uh, for the vandalization of uh, uh, pipelines. They also know who is responsible for this oil, illegal oil trade. So. Um, using them uh, to secure the facilities is, is a welcome development. Although I have not gotten any information if any of uh, the key players in the in River State are in, involved. Uh, government on Polo is in Delta State. Um, so probably, they are probably doing this in Delta State as a case study, but it would be great if they extend it to Bayelsa, Rivers, Aquaibum, and other oil producing states as well, uh, engaging uh, the people, especially those who call the OS militant generals, because uh, they they have the influence, they have the capacity uh, to stop stop this. Uh, my my community in particular, let me say, um, some time ago, uh, we were going through. Um, issues around sea piracy. People were attacking, uh, because you, you have to travel from Port Harcourt to my community by boat within 45 minutes. And, you know, when people are traveling, you see a lot of, you know, sea pirates attacking, you know, those uh, that are traveling. And it was, the government could not address that issue. They sent a lot of gunboats, a lot of uh, naval boats to secure the waterways. But believe me, they did not have the capacity to address it until the community came together to say they needed to set up a local vigilante force to stop it. And today, the waterways are quiet and we can travel very peacefully from Port Harcourt by boat to my community. 
So you can see that communities themselves have the capacity to resolve these issues. And looking at you know the amount of money you're calling, it, it may it may look very it may sound very big, but it's not because <clears throat> kind of projects within the riverine areas is very expensive. Building a house within riverine communities is more expensive than building a house in Port Harcourt or any other upland city. So they need to buy gun posts, they need to buy speed posts, they need to, you know, settle um, just uh, as a way of stipend, settle uh, chiefs and other key players within nearby communities to make sure that they get that local acceptance. After all, what we, you know, used to say that our communities are benefiting from this, you know, oil business, if not for opportunities like this. So I will very much encourage this opportunity. Um, you spoke of unemployed youths going into bunkering and illegal refining of uh, petroleum products as an alternative to generate uh, revenue since they are not gainfully employed. Let me ask you a question. Do you think it will be in the government's interest to decentralize um, crude oil refining and actually encourage these youths to refine but with proper training and proper equipment? As a Niger Delta man, as a... Um, as someone from uh, River State, you mentioned that the illegal bunkering is one of the contributing factors uh, towards the black suit problem uh, River State is currently facing. Do you think it would make sense if this refining is decentralized and smaller and medium scale players are also allowed to come into this business properly equipped um, with all the necessary safety equipment and the necessary training. Do you think that's a solution to uh, the country's current financial woes and uh, oil shortage? Is it something you would like to blossom in the future? Please, what are your thoughts? Um, um, thank you for the question. First of all, as a potential uh, government official and uh, a, a law-abiding citizen, I am not in support of illegal bunkering or any illegal activity. But however, uh, I think engaging uh, those that are involved in this illegal bunkering activity is very key and critical to resolving the issue. And the federal government cannot claim ignorance that they are not aware of the issues. They are aware. Um, some years ago, uh, His Excellency, the Vice President of Nigeria, visited the Niger Delta. <coughs> And there was a very strong commitment uh, in series uh, of stakeholders' meetings that, uh, you know, they are very proud that our, our, you know, young, our youth have the technical capacity to um, refine petroleum products. However, they are not happy with the fact that they are following this illegal process. So there was a commitment that the federal government was going to initiate uh, and make it easier for youth to have access to modular refineries and own uh, the modular refineries themselves. And oh, wow. you know, pay taxes to the federal government. I am sure you've heard of the word modular refinery. Oh, yes, I have. But then when the paperwork started, there were a series, believe me, there were a series of bureaucratic bottlenecks and our indigenous and you know fellow Niger Deltans could not have access to these licenses. As the group general manager of NMPC, how many enjoy use, how many Ishakiri use or Niger Delta use have access you know, to owning modular refineries? Because they have made it so difficult for them to have access to this. In fact, when that commitment was made there was a, a significant reduction in illegal refining because of the expectation that a lot of our young people who have access to these licenses to begin to establish <coughs> local modular refineries. But then, 
I, I can confidently say that the process has not just been politicized, it has also been regionalized because I cannot see any of our Niger data people owning uh, these refineries. Neither do they also own licenses to establish these refineries. So um, we still have a long way to go. So uh, it's not about going about destroying, even if you look at it, the, the Nigerian Navy is also contributing to the black suit. Hmm. And I'm going to explain it to you because they, they, on the waterway, if they, you know, get uh, possibly a boat carrying illegal products, they set it on fire. And when they set it on fire, it contributes to the black suit problem because the smoke just goes around. So even the security forces are not properly trained in the disposition of, you know, these products. So wow. I am confidently saying that it is important for the federal government itself to be sincere in not just managing the relationships with Niger Deltans and the use of the Niger Delta in addressing this problem. But then they should also be sincere and train their security forces in the management of these relationships and also in the management of the products when they are able to seize them uh, in our waterways. Not just that, they should reduce the bureaucratic bottlenecks that enables our indigents in having access to the licenses. And then there should be increased funding for capacity building, both within and outside the country. There should be, you know, the CBN should be given enough resources to make it open for our indigents to have access to funding. Some of the Chinese companies that are coming here to build roads and, you know, railway uh, uh, stations and all that, they come with Chinese contractors. So if you don't, you cannot just say, oh, we are giving you licenses. No, our people should be able to have access to adequate funding to establish these modular refineries. Their capacities, their capacities should be built to, you know, uh, market the products and manage the products as well as, you know, um, creating employment opportunities for themselves. And then it, it, with that, uh, you begin to see that uh, uh, there will be a significant drop in uh, the air pollution that we are having, not just in Port Harcourt, but its surrounding environments as well. I absolutely love this guy. I like this guy. I like, I like what I'm hearing. I like what I'm hearing. But I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to keep allowing him to talk. Maybe Thanks. I can like him a little more. Let us talk about the youths. You keep speaking about the youths. This is why I like you. I like to hear youths. As far as I'm concerned, I'm 46 years old. I don't know exactly how old you are, but I, I am 37 years old. Oh, Same wow. Age you we are a youth. You yes. are a youth. I believe I'm already getting old. I'm, I believe I'm gradually leaving the youth. Uh, <laughs> you, are each, you are a youth. You are more of a youth, you know, than so many people who are claiming to be youth. You know, but I'm so happy because I want a Nigeria for the future. I want to see things that look like future prospects. I love hearing uh, things like modular refining, uh, refineries, um, engaging the youth. Because until we start looking inwards and until we start prioritizing the upcoming generation as against the outgoing elder statesman generation, we will continue being in the doldrums. We will continue being uh, inside the quagmire that we're in. Now, River State has uh, a statistic earlier on. That's why I told to give me 10 minutes so I could just familiarize myself with some of the figures um, from River State. The population of youth in River State is substantially more than the population of the older people. The question is, what are your plans for the youths? Immediate, uh, the long-term plans, and 
how do you plan? You could just touch on a few things here and there to gainfully engage the youth. Cultism is another major problem um, that we hear of from um, Port Harcourt. Okay, we understand refining oil because you have no job. We don't understand why they're cultists and, and, and all that. So how do you plan to address that menace, especially with the high numbers in River State? And what are your plans to gainfully engage the youths? Um, first of all, if uh, youths are gainfully employed, I don't think they will engage themselves in cultism uh, because, uh, one, I grew up in a very uh, local area, in, in a slum. So I know, uh, while, while growing up, I, I saw a lot of these, uh, you know, cultists, you know, carry out their activities. And um, at, at that time, uh, most of them were living... Uh, within my surrounding, I knew them by name, and uh, uh, however, um, I saw that most of them didn't have, you know, jobs to sustain themselves, and uh, as a result of that, they engaged themselves in different kind of illegal um, activities. So, uh, one of the things uh, that we are going to focus on is to uh, make it easier for youths to have access to microcredits to strengthen small businesses, and uh, you 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 cannot because this is government money. We must manage it with transparency and accountability. So uh, you cannot have access to that process until you are you know uh, properly registered with our you know, social protection program. And like I have uh, said to a, a couple of media organizations, that we are going to invest significantly in birth and death registration. And we are also going to invest in ensuring that if you are an indigenous of River State, you register for the social protection program. So we are going to get your fingerprints, we are going to get uh, your data, and that will, that will enable us to have access to uh, verifiable and uh, credible data that both uh, national and international community can rely on. And it will also enable us, because while registering, you are going to answer a number of questions around, uh, you know, your education, your level of education, uh, employment, work experience, and if you also want to, um, and if you also want to have access to uh, getting support from the state government. So uh, as a result of that, we'll have a first-hand understanding of uh, the number of unemployed youths in the state. Now, let me also bring you back a bit. Most of the intervention programs that both federal government and state governments are carrying out are not addressing... Go ahead. The, ...are not addressing the root causes of the problem. They, they don't understand what these youths are facing. And until you are able to issue a questionnaire, carry out a very careful analysis of what the issues are, and then come up with you know, a program that will enhance uh, their capacity to have access, not just access to these loans, but also giving them the needed support to carry out the businesses that they need, you will not be able to address it in a sustainable manner. So some of the employment programs you're seeing are just surface dressing. If you ask some governors, how many youth in your states are unemployed? They don't know. They don't have the figures. How many small mm. businesses have collapsed within the past one year as a result of lack of electricity, as a result of, you know, lack of uh, uh, resources to pay for their rent or lack of money to pay for their rent as a result of human resources, as a result of poor capacity in managing businesses. We don't have these figures. We don't have this data. And that is why most of the developed countries are far ahead of us. So until we go back, you know, to the roots, to the drawing board, to have this data, to, you know, 
address this issue, whatever intervention we are coming up with will just be seen as <clears throat> surface dressing. So if we are elected into power, <clears throat> my government will want to dwell in working with data. We will want to have these numbers so that it will influence our planning. Our planning and our policies will be evidence-based. And I believe with that, we will not just resolve this employment challenge in a more sustainable manner. Even the government that will be coming on board to take over from us will have access to this data to learn so that they will be able to resolve these issues in future if it occurs. Then one of the reasons why the developed countries work with data is because the students in the university should have access to this information online to learn so that as they grow up to take over the mantle of leadership, they will be able to know what worked in the past and what did not work in the past. And it will also help them to make informed decisions to address these challenges if they arise in future. So I think okay. I am told to, we have the capacity to address the employment challenges in River State. Uh, uh. All right. Governor Wike is the current governor of River State. If you are privileged to take over the mantle of leadership from him, what do you consider worthy of maintaining and what do you consider worthy uh, to be done away with from the PDP-led government? Let me ask you that question. Uh, there are a number of things uh, Wike is doing that I have, I have strong admiration for. There are also a couple of things that I do not like. Uh, I appreciate and recognize the fact that he's investing significantly uh, on infrastructure, and that includes <clears throat> building of roads and building of bridges, you know, building of uh, um, university uh, lecture halls and facilities and all that. And uh, I would not say it is a new thing. The Rotimi Amishi's government also invested uh, in building healthcare facilities and upgrading some of these facilities to Scottish hospitals, setting up and strengthening the state primary healthcare board, and, and, and so on. Uh, the admissions government also invested as a result of, uh, I have uh, this information as a result of some of the research that uh, my uh, research team has carried out. They also invested in, uh, you know, making sure that citizens have access to housing they invested in the monorail project in as much as a lot of people say, oh, it's a white elephant project and all that. I think rightfully, successful governments are supposed to, you know, um, start from where their predecessors stopped. Because irrespective of the fact that, you know, the projects that they embarked on are white elephant projects or not, we must be able to have value for money. Oh. And we must recognize that these funds, these monies, belong to the people of River State. And so if we say we want to abandon that project, it is River people that are losing. So oh. whatever projects that Rotimi and Meshi abandoned or yes, some week they could not complete at the end of this tenor, we will make sure that we come up with a strategic team to complete those projects. It is not as a result of our making, but I think it is our responsibility as a government that is coming in, we must have that obligation to complete these projects. Even if we see that uh, cost-effective approaches we are not applied in, uh, in giving out those projects or in the implementation of those projects. But for the fact that we must have value for money. And we recognize the fact that this is not Amish's money. This is not Yes on Wiki's money. We must complete those projects. So uh, in the first place, a lot of governments make mistakes. If you look at the Wiki's administration now, they've abandoned the monorail projects. They have abandoned the uh, Rainbow City projects from the Rotimi Amish's uh, government. And that is because 
they lack the capacity to realize that the money that was spent on that project belongs to rivers people and not them. So you must, as a government, you must recognize that the office that you are occupying is bigger than you. All the emotions you feel, all the hatred you feel for your predecessor. Until mm. you realize that, you will not be able to take the right steps to complete this project. And that is exactly what is mm. going on. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Let's talk about women. Nigeria in general has women relegated to the background. Um, yes, I know that. Oh, wow. We're having some network challenges. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay. So awesome. I was saying that in Nigeria, it's, it's I don't I think it's from your side. I think my side is okay. Okay, is it better now? Okay, Tonto. We're having trouble loading this live video. Okay, Tonto is saying she's having trouble loading the video. Yes, it's better now. Okay. It's better okay. now. Let me from other I can make sure it's not my side that is having the issues. Uh, just one second. Okay, it's better now. Let me from other. I make sure it's not my side that is. Uh, <laughs> sorry, hold on one second. Okay, even though it's not too clear. Side that is. Okay. Well, can you hear me now? Oh, go ahead. Yes. Just one so, okay. I was talking about. I was talking about um, women empowerment. What are your plans in that regard? Aside, of course, um, bringing Tonto Dike as part of your team, what are your plans? Um. Uh, over the years, I have worked uh, with women, and I know women have special needs. Uh, that includes uh, access to empower economic empowerment programs. Uh, most women uh, are, uh, are widows. Uh, most of them are not uh, also uh, economically empowered. They, do they don't also have the opportunities as uh, men do. So uh, for, for us, uh, what we intend doing is to strengthen uh, the Ministry of Women Affairs to uh, strengthen uh, the capacity of its officials to have access to sufficient data on the needs of uh, reversed women. Like I said, we cannot work unless our policies are evidence-based. So we must work with data. So first of all, we must clearly understand uh, uh, the issues affecting women uh, from having uh, access to economic empowerment programs and uh, their health challenges and also uh, the challenges, uh, their socioeconomic challenges within the communities and within the society. And that will inform the approach we are going to take. But uh, building on uh, previous experiences, I know there are so many reverse women that are hardworking, but they don't have uh, the startup grant or the government support to create enabling environments for them to uh, sustain their businesses. And we are going to work uh, on that. We're also aware that, uh, you know, a lot of young girls tend to go into uh, prostitution to sustain their families as a result of uh, lack of employment. I mean, uh, that also contributes significantly to uh, the, the spread of, um, um, you know, sexually transmitted diseases and also 
um, unwanted re resulting into unwanted pregnancies as well. We are also aware of the fact that unwanted pregnancies and unsafe abortions contributes to a significant proportion of uh, you know maternal deaths. You know, so what we need to do is to make informed decisions as a result of the findings of the research and uh, you know the baseline assessments that we will carry out. But that is why we also have you know a woman as my deputy governorship running mate. She is going to spearhead this process to make sure that there is adequate in investment in empowering. Uh, and strengthening the capacity of our women to make sure that they take their rightful position in uh, decision-making relating to uh, uh, both uh, economic and social activities of the state. Hmm. Okay, <clears throat> let me open up my line so a few people can reach out and ask you a few questions. So um, let me just invite a few people let them let one or two people ask you a few questions and i'll continue with the questioning section or session i beg your pardon um i'm, I'm very happy with the things i'm hearing especially with regards to youths and empowerment all right well, please introduce yourself and go ahead with your question daddy first it's nice to talk to you nice to talk to you too um i've heard everything what the man has been saying. I'm not trying to be rude, whatever. Um, I just want to make some point here. Since my dad was born, I've been hearing about Nigeria. It's going to be good. Nigeria is going to be good. Since I was born too, Nigeria is going to be good. Nigeria is going to be good. I'm so sorry to say, I don't want to hurt so many people that is here at the first. Like, I've been watching for a long time. I don't believe Nigeria can be good. We have a very, very, very bad leadership. And that was our problem. Me personally, I think everybody should go their separate ways. Are you getting me that phrase? Everybody should I'm go listening. their separate ways. This too much talk, Nigeria is going to be good. Nigeria is going to be good. It's just bullshit. If nobody want to go their separate ways, I think the youth, like... For my own opinion, I'm so sorry. I don't want to hurt anybody in Nigeria. I think it's better to start killing the politicians. I don't want hey. to hey. Down, you no, cannot, no, cannot, no, let's just fight. The truth you, is cannot, you have to be careful. I understand your point of view, but we cannot incite um, that kind of uh, tension. And uh, that's why I had to remove him. Um, guys, I'm sorry, but... Uh, mm. but for me, I, I think it is, it is, it is rude disrespectful and unpatriotic to say Nigeria will never be. Mm, 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 mm. Oops, wow. Hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, clearly, clearly I can hear you. Yes, I for one, Very I, clearly. I don't have the intention or the plan to live outside of Nigeria. So no matter how comfortable you are in any country, there can never... Um, that the freezer. I have traveled to over 35 countries. I know that there are so many Nigerians that are not doing well. The kind of pictures they portray on social media is different from what they, they really face. Some of them, I mean, hotels, they've come to clean my rooms, and I know the first hand experience they face in the country where they live in. So we must not, I, I must commend the fact that you were able to stop him. We must not encourage unpatriotic behaviors. We have only Nigeria, and we must do everything to the last drop of our blood to defend the existence of this country. And I thank you for that. Thank you so much to, um, for your thoughts on that. Let me bring one more person, and then we begin to round off. Okay. So um, I, I really enjoyed the session, and I look forward to having more sessions with you in the future. Uh, you, sir. It could not be here for one reason or the other. Okay, we've got, we've got a gentleman here. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, I, first of all, my name is Abdukare. I disagree with the guy that said Nigeria should split. I'm from Hedo State. You know, um, I think a lot of people don't understand the power of numbers. 
A lot of people don't understand the power of quantity. Now, hero couldn't do what they are supposed to do to Russia because of how big, how powerful oh. Russia is. Russia could overpower Ukraine because of his numbers, his quantity. China could do to what he's doing to Taiwan because of how, you know, their, how, uh, the, their population, how big China is. The same thing to India. So I don't think um, breaking up Nigeria is the best thing. We need everybody. We need, we need body. We need body. Awusas, the Yoruba, the Hebos. You know, we will be stronger. Like we will we'll be more powerful together than breaking Nigeria into pieces. That is not to our interest. Now, um, pertaining what this guy was talking about. Um, giving you know helping helping people to get loan build building modular refinery you know um it is not as easy as he is saying it now you can't just give loan to people you can't just give loan to people now in one one of the best thing that happens to nigeria is nin which is national identity number if Nigerian government understand the power of that thing, Nigeria will be a better place. America could give loan to its citizen grants because of the social security number. Now, with your social security number, you could build your credibility. People started building credibility by just credit card. You know, you get a credit card. How you utilize your credit card goes a long way. And then there's what is called credit score. Sometimes those are the things that determine the amount of loan you get or if you even get the loan or not. You know, I expect the guy to talk more about, you know, the hand and hand. You can't just give loan to people because the person say, I can build a refinery. It doesn't work that way. Of course, you want to help your people, but you will waste those resources. So that that that's just that's just my own opinion. Nigeria shouldn't break. We need everybody. Thank you. That. Thank you so much. I truly appreciate your contribution. Thank you so much for that. Um, let me bring Shoshei on. Thank you, brother. That was nice. All right. All right. I'm still trying to bring him back. Uh, and then one thing before you take me off. Yes, sir. Um, you see, Europe has been trying to cut off from Russia and uh, Hawaii, Russia gas. Do you know, I've been watching the news. I've never heard Nigeria with all the gas and oil we have. Hmm. You understand? When they said, oh, we want to get gas from this person, they don't mention Nigeria. Like, why? I think everybody that wants to come to power right now should be looking into that. And one of the major reasons is because Nigeria is not reliable. Nigerian is not a reliable supplier. And that is the reason nobody wants to do business with Nigeria. A lot of people think it's because we're Africa. That is not true. Like the issue you have with Niger Delta militant bombing pipeline and stuff like that, those things affect the country image. Uh. All right. Um, one more question and then let me hand over to... Uh, um... to um, our governorship aspirant. Okay. Candidate. So our governorship candidate, yes. Candidate. Sorry for that. So, my dear brother, um, Shoshi, Shei, over to you. Well, um, Toto, God bless you for your contribution. My brother, God bless you for believing in Nigeria. One thing I will continue to say is all these countries we are making mention to, have we gone ahead, the younger generations, have you read their story? Do you know where they are coming from? Do you know how they got to where they are today? We are not doing bad in Nigeria. Can it be better? 
Absolutely, yes. Do we have challenges? Yes. But as a child of history, I know it is inside challenges that we can make progress. Nigeria is a country, I always argue with people, and I say, Nigeria is the easiest country to govern in the whole world. We are the most loyal people. Once you have a good leader, Nigerians will follow you. Nigerians will follow you. Once you are a good leader and they, see, they believe in you, everybody will kill at your back. So, I think in as much as even America is still saying they are so divided within themselves. Mm. So, Nigeria is not immune to what is happening all over the world. But how, how do we go better mm. by having a good leader? You talk of gas, you talk of everything. My dear brother, all the resources we still have in Nigeria are there. Mm. Everything is still there, on top. Mm. That we've not touched. Is it gold? Is it precious stones? Is it the gas you've mentioned? Is it crude or uh, 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 bitumen? Mm. That we've not even tapped into. So these are the things that made me believe that Nigeria will be great again. If what some people have stole in Nigeria, they steal it in some other countries, their economy will collapse. Mm. But despite that, look at how they have been stealing. Mm. Despite that, we are not yet collapsed. So it shows that we have great potentials. All we are just praying for is good leadership. If I am shouting about a particular candidate, I'm not God. I cannot read his mind. I'm only reading his actions. And that is why I, I'm looking at his actions and I'm looking at it, okay, if he, because of what he has talked about, what I has th think about, when somebody has been fighting for something for over 23 years and it's not happening now, and they blocked him that time. And everybody's now saying, okay, it's that thing that we should do now. So why wouldn't I want to support such people? So these are my own reasons. I believe in Nigeria. I love Nigeria. As I am in America, I used to tell people, I am a second-class citizen. Huh. No matter what. Let me carry the blue... I'm still using my Nigeria passport. I'm not yet a citizen of America. But let me get the blue passport safe. I am... I, there are places I cannot attend to. There are places I can never attend to. I cannot attend to be a president of America. Nobody's going to give it to me. I was not born here. Hmm. Do you, do you know why? Do you know why you can't be the president of America? I think I think that was the best decision America ever make in their life. Now, if you're not born in a when you're born in a place, you get so attached to that place. That you can place. hear what you're talking about Nigerian passports. Now, when you become a All president right, guys. of America, allow, when you become a president of America, guess to answer the questions you've asked. Thank you so much for joining us live, Kareem. Uh, thank you so much. I appreciate you. And also, a big appreciation goes to Shei. Shei, thank you so much. So, finally, what are your thoughts, sir? Um, I, I would like to say, uh, first of all, the, the first person that spoke, uh, you know, asked a question or possibly making an observation, but the other two were making comments, so um, oh. they were making contributions. Um, for the first person, if he maybe he did not attend uh, or he did not join this program on time, uh, social protection, social security, they are almost the same thing. And I did mention that we want to invest significantly in debt and debt registration. 
And how do you invest on that? You must make sure that people have access to social protection numbers. And, mm. you know, from childbirth. And those that are already born will also have access to these numbers. Hence, the need for registration. But then we, we, don't, we are also very careful of the fact that uh, people have different numbers. There is NIN, there is, you know, uh, B, uh, BVN. There are so many duplicative numbers. But if we are going to have uh, access to social protection numbers, it must be that it's going to uh, be there for the purpose of case study, hoping that the federal government will see our intervention as a best practice and begin to scale up to other oh. states. And then we will be able to harmonize the data that we are having, including sensitive data, as well as you know fingerprints and all that. That will help uh, us to um, have access to security information for every citizen so that with you know, the DNA um, of a person, you will be able to go to a crime scene and know who committed the crime. And people should be able to go to a database to know, uh, as the, with their DNA, to know who their relatives are that they are not aware of. Maybe their father is dead and all that. This, this data is there in America. You can just be born, and if you go to a DNA data bank, you'll be able to know if, you have, if your father has children in another state. And mm. you'll be able to contact them because you have access to their contact information. So talking about loans, you know, people should rightfully have access to loans and credits because uh, it is not everybody that is born with the opportunity of, you know, coming from a family with, you know, silver spoon and all that. And not just having access to microcredits to strengthen your business, you should be able to have access to loans to go to school. The reason why we are going to have a database <coughs> for social protection is uh -huh. from going to school to having a job to having loans, you will be able to have access to a portal. And if you are unable to pay for these loans because you are part of that portal, you will not be able to have access to future loans. That is why we must make sure that our portal is credible so that people will be encouraged to pay back their loans in order for more people to have access um, to the loans, to strengthen uh, their businesses. So uh, I, I have studied development a lot and you cannot you know, develop a country or a community without having access to credible data and information. So the first approach you must take is to have a baseline assessment to understand why the problem is existing in the first place. Who is oh. responsible for that problem? Oh. And, then has, and then you find out if there has been any previous intervention to address that problem and why it worked and why it did not work. That will help you make informed decision on uh, whether you want to follow the same approach uh -huh. when you are addressing that issue. So we have the know-how. What I expect a lot of young people to do, believe me, Daddy Freeze, the level of toxicity and bitterness I see on social media is too high. A lot of young people have lost faith in Nigeria, and then they become very toxic. Anybody that comes up with a fantastic idea Instead of questioning it, they just criticize it. So there is this blanket approach to every innovative idea. And if we start to see every idea as bad or manipulative or confusing, then it means our problems will persist. So people should be given the opportunity to come up with innovative approaches to address the challenges that we as young people will face until we realize the fact that we are the solution to our problems, we will continue to remain where we are. We will continue to want to travel to other countries. But then we are only a tenant in those countries. 